Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Really delighted to be back with all of you for our continuing coverage of the UN General Assembly here in its 75th anniversary and bringing you a very special guest, Henrietta Four, who's, of course, the Executive Director of UNICEF. Henrietta, thank you for taking some time to have this discussion today. My pleasure, Raj. It is a great occasion. Thanks. Well, it is a great occasion on the 75th anniversary, but very different than probably what we would have expected, right? I, I mean, this was meant to be a celebratory year. It's anything but that, um, as the world faces down this pandemic and the consequences for children are absolutely dire, as you have been, you know, kind of shouting from the mountaintops these last weeks and months. Um, so I want to talk with you about sort of the moment that we're in right now, and maybe starting with the pandemic. Maybe not everybody realizes that UNICEF is actually going to be leading on vaccine uh, delivery in many parts of the world, working with the COVAX facility at Gavi as part of the ACT Accelerator. So I want to get your kind of broad take on where do you see we are today at this moment in September when it comes to the global pandemic and its effect on especially the, the most vulnerable children in the world? Uh, Raj, thank you. So it is a very interesting time for the world. And because you brought up the 75th anniversary, I think one of our reflections is that UNICEF was actually created at a time like this, when the world had just had a real crisis, there were lots of children in need, and so UNICEF was created to help. So we were, in a way, organized for this. We cover humanitarian and development. So in the time of COVID, most countries came to us with a first request, which was to communicate, to communicate to their own people. They wanted to tell them what actually uh, they needed to know about COVID, how to keep themselves safe. And they needed to do it in major universal languages and in all of their local dialects. And the second thing they needed from us was personal protective equipment. So get a mount, uh, masks and gowns and um, everything that would try to keep you and children safe. And that's been a big request that has now kind of subsided a bit. So now Raj, there are four things we're focusing on. One is immunizations. Uh, the second is distance learning. The third is water. And the last one is mental health. And it's because uh, all of us need all of them. And without that, then the time of COVID will indeed be dark days rather than the opportunities that lie ahead to really reach all children. Well, let's talk about each of those because each one deserves you know, its own probably significant session. Uh, they're all so important and so unprecedented. So just starting with vaccines, obviously UNICEF has a lot of experience with vaccines because many vaccines are given to children. Um, and so this is an area of focus for you. This is a bit different. This will be a vaccine for everyone on earth. Presumably every person in the planet will need to get access to one. Uh, there are many vaccine candidates as we've been covering at DevX and lots of debate about the timeline for this. What are you seeing when it comes to your, your work to deliver this vaccine uh, as it gets approved, as it is you know, shown to be safe, what do you think the timeline is for the kind of low and middle income countries that, that UNICEF is serving? Um, actually, I think the acquisition of a vaccine is moving along at an extraordinarily fast pace, uh, faster than we'd ever seen before. And so as you have mentioned, what UNICEF does is it creates common bids. And so we are a place where vaccine orders are gathered and we then place those orders with the manufacturers. So we've got more than a hundred low and middle income countries that are now part of this vaccine alliance that we do with Gavi and um, everyone. This is and, the COVAX facility, right, as it's known? Correct. And we've got more than 80 wealthy countries that are well-developed who are also part of it. So that's a good mix, Raj. Uh, companies are at work on it. The research and development uh, arms are at work. The testing arms are at work. So I think that is um, moving along at a good pace. It's accelerating and financing is coming in. What is not yet there when you look around the world is the human demand for it. So what's happening in our world is that families are not coming in for basic healthcare services. And it can be uh, mothers who are pregnant. They're not coming in for prenatal care. They're not coming in for postnatal care. Most countries, it's completely disrupted. And it's because uh, you're often afraid to go into a facility, think you'll catch COVID, 
or their transportation disruption, so you're not able to get in, or it's the healthcare workers. They're either inundated at their facilities, or they are worried that they don't have protective equipment, or they are feeling that they can't do their usual door-to-door -door in person work. So we need to have populations say yes, vaccines work. I'm going to take my children in for them. I'm going to go in and be vaccinated myself. So it's going to be very important that we also talk to populations, to the people. Yeah, this is a tough problem to solve. And as you say, there are good reasons why people aren't accessing their health systems in many cases. We've been covering this at DevX and you often find uh, health facilities might be closed due to the pandemic, or they're telling people actively, you know, this is now a facility for COVID. It's not a place to come for other kinds of services. And, you know, women who are giving birth might be afraid to go in for prenatal services, afraid they'll catch the virus instead of taking care of themselves. It's a complicated set of issues. I wonder, one of the issues that is, relates to COVAX is this idea of vaccine nationalism, that some countries, wealthier countries, will say, we're going to make orders for the vaccine, and that will take precedence over others getting it, especially low and middle income countries, is something that the Gates Foundation has been talking about in their latest goalkeeper report. Is that something you're involved in at UNICEF or you personally, in terms of trying to convince people that we ought to not take a nationalistic approach to vaccines? Well, any, anything you wanna say on that topic? Yes, yeah, so um, as you know, Raj, we are speaking to everyone about the importance that uh, number one, the healthcare workers in country are able to be vaccinated so they can feel safe as they are out working. We also want the teachers to be covered so that they feel safe when they're with the children. So it's very important that you prioritize populations because there won't be, you, you cannot vaccinate an entire world all at once. Uh, but the fair distribution, the um, distribution that's for all and that we are certainly able to get to the marginalized groups like refugees and internally displaced people. I mean, we, we, we must be a fair world. We must be an inclusive world. And it's, we are talking about it everywhere. So uh, thank yeah, the you science for seems to back, the, the science seems to back up the idea that if we get equitable distribution of the vaccine, you actually have a better chance of, of stopping the virus than if it's just one country at a time in kind of an inequitable way. And yet a lot of of the leaders I speak to say it's a real concern. It, it, vaccine nationalism is something that we may well see play out in real life, in real time, in just the next coming months. Well, and every country will probably make different decisions about who are essential. And that will play out. But for those of us who have a chance uh, to create um, these buying cooperatives, we hopefully will have the vaccine, we will have um, fair and equitable ways to distribute them, and then it will be up to the countries to place them in the places of greatest need. Now you talked about the disruption to learning, and it is something that I think no one could have ever imagined before, the idea that children across the world, almost all children, would be out of school all at once. And in many parts of the world, as UNICEF has been, has been telling people, not getting back into schools, what is the situation as we look at it today? And do you have a sense of when you think kids will by and large be back in schools? Well, we just did a survey and checked with countries to see if they had dates for when schools can reopen in their country. And um, one quarter of the countries do not have dates and there are countries all over the world. So I think many families and children are not sure about their own schooling timing. Uh, and one of the needs that all of us have now is that there are settings that have low technology or no technology and others that do have the technology, but they don't have school systems and curriculum that can easily be downloaded or they can be downloaded affordably for everyone. So there are vast inequalities and that's what COVID has um, sh shown a light on. I mean, we are a very unequal world. Half the world is not connected. And right now we've got at least half the world's children out of school. So it's those children we need to reach. We need to reach them now. The longer they stay out of school, the longer um, they may never return to school. And for many children who are on the move, let's say coming out of conflict, they don't have a school to return to. So yeah. if we want that other half of children returning to school, we're going to have to be very proactive as a world, get them back in school, invest in our schools 
so that there is a way to have remote and distance learning when they are not doing face-to-face -face learning. Yeah, all over the world, there are stories of people using WhatsApp, teachers you know, trying to teach by radio, trying to teach on television. You know, there's so many groups that are trying to find ways to do this. But for so many kids, school is more than just education. It's also a place where they get food. It's a place where they're safe, uh, where they may have access to clean water. Uh, it serves so many purposes, and the idea that it, it's disrupted for hundreds of millions of kids around the world all at once is pretty shocking. Well, it is. So we've launched this initiative called um, Reimagine Education. We think that in the next few years, we could connect every school and every learner to the internet. It's a big public-private partnership, but we could come out of the time of COVID-19 stronger as a world. So this is our moment. I mean, it's a once in a generation moment. We can really leapfrog the technologies and let's see if we can't create a level playing field for this next generation. It will be an extraordinary gift for them because they want to connect. They're, they, <laughs> this is a generation that wants to be online. So let's help them. Yeah, as you say, the pandemic has really showed that the inequalities, we all, we all knew you know, the world was very unequal, but boy, it's stark at a moment like this when one kid has access to the internet and can at least learn from home at some level and another just has nothing and has no way of doing that. I mean, it's so stark at a moment like this. And I do wonder though, if do you feel in your perch, because you spend your time on the phone with, with donor agencies, you are the former head of USAID um, you know, some years ago, you, you, ha you know the international funding system well, do you feel like there's the level of ambition and urgency? Uh, you just talked about a big, bold idea of connecting every school in the world. I mean, are you feeling that there is that level of political will to do big things like that at this moment, or are countries still more focused on their own situation? I think there's both. So countries are concerned about their own situation because they weren't expecting to be caught this way. They thought that they had good health systems and that it would be taken care of. It would just sort of be a fluke. So I think they are thinking about themselves, but they're also ready for big ideas. I mean, it, whenever a crisis hits, you have to think about how you can come out of it stronger. What we do not yet have in our world is an easy way for businesses and governments and the nonprofit sector to work together in simple, fast moving uh, systems. And as a result, we don't have those public private partnerships that are set up and ready to go. So that's why we've, we've put one together in hopes that this could drive it, but we're gonna need a lot of commitment and it's gonna to have to go through World Bank IMF meetings. It's gonna to have to go through the G7 and the G20. It's gonna to have to be public and private. And every company that can help us has to pitch in now so that we can come out stronger in a couple of years because we now have the technologies with lower satellites and with fiber optic cables, Wi-Fi. We have the chance to do this and we just, we have to grab that chance. It world. is remarkable, you know, at a moment like this where so much of the action is around public-private partnerships and, and it's, you know, maybe something we're all kind of used to in a way so we don't think twice about it, but Gavi, the COVAX facility, the ACT Accelerator, of course, CEPI developing vaccines, especially on this global health side, you see that these public-private partnerships, these alliances that were set up years ago that have companies, that have governments, that have dif different development agencies, UN agencies as part of them, they're kind of here and ready to move in a way that it's harder for other agencies to do. And it sounds like that's sort of what you're pointing to. And it is, it is interesting, even at a moment like we're here at the 75th anniversary of UN General Assembly, but even an institution as powerful as the UN and agencies as important as UNICEF can't really just do it alone when we're talking about really big problems like connecting all the schools in the world. Yes, um, exactly. So the health area, got out early. Um, they really created some very powerful public-private partnerships that were big funding mechanisms and big gathering points. Education is a little bit behind, but this is our chance now to get it right up there. Because if there were anything that you would want to focus on in this time period, where you want to invest as a country, health and education are just your priorities. So um, if we can have the education area catch up to health, we will have done something very strong for the world and for and this what a, generation. 
And, and where does Safe Water connect to this? Because I've heard you talk a lot about Safe Water as one of these pillars of action for UNICEF. Why Safe Water? Is it, you know, obviously hand washing has made, you know, everyone is, is used to this now. And, and it, it does point to the reality that many people don't have access to clean water, even to do something as basic as wash their hands. But, but why now? Why is Safe Water now one of your priority issues? Well, um, UNICEF has been working in water for a lot of years, and you know we do both humanitarian and development work. So in humanitarian situations, one of the first things that any population needs is water. So we've developed a lot of expertise where we can see how essential it is. I mean, it's, it's hard to cook um, dinner without water. It's hard to wash your hands. So when we look around the world, um, two out of every five people do not have water that they can wash their hands in a bar of soap at home. Two out of five schools do not have a toilet where there is a place where you can wash your hands and have a bar of soap. It means that children can't learn basic hygiene. And if they can't learn and practice basic hygiene, it's gonna be hard to keep them safe from a COVID or any other disease that's coming through their world. Um, we also have this problem with health clinics, hospitals, um, any of the primary health care community areas. I mean, you need to be able to wash your hands and have some sort of soap between patients if you are a nurse or a doctor. We have to deliver this to the world. I mean, this is just a time when we could, when we should. And Raj, one of the things we dream about is that the young people can help us in this. There are a lot of them who are not gonna be getting a job the way we are. They're gonna to need to be entrepreneurs. Water systems and setting them up for their schools is a, school, is a skill that you can learn, you can do with your classmates at a variety of ages. It's, it's interesting, it's uh, built skills, and it will connect our schools and our homes to water and good sanitation. So safe water and water we think is necessary for communities, all of the communities. Is there a big idea around this along the lines of what you just described for connecting schools? You know, you can see how connecting schools is the kind of thing where we could leapfrog coming out of a pandemic where you know, many of the, the most successful companies in the world, the big technology companies are actually doing really well during this pandemic, which is almost amazing, but they're, they're getting bigger, right? And they're looking for ways they can give back and the technology is advancing very quickly around connectivity. You can see how the stars might align and an organization like UNICEF with your convening power might be able to drive that. Is there a similar big idea around safe water for schools, for example, or for clinics where you see a way to scale this quickly? Because there's a long history of failed water projects, failed water schemes, you know, high percentage of water points in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia don't work after they were installed in schools. Is there something new and different that you think now is the moment to catalyze this issue? So Raj, it's a great question. And it's one that we would love people's thoughts on. So uh, we know it's gonna to have to be public and private. Uh, we know that water is changing. So water scarcity, the whole climate change um, discussions that we are going under as a world are all changing. And so you need to take that into account as you think about national water systems, you think about cities and towns and how they will work. But there's lots of new technology out. Water filtration technology is moving fast, but water itself is still an, um, a substance that you need to create for us to drink and for us to use for hygiene purposes. It's still our least expensive because it's not valued the way others are. So I think water is going to be essential, but we don't have as yet that affordable, sustainable, big new leap in technology. We need um, good old fashioned water, but we need new ways to deliver it. So anyone with ideas, we're wide open, ready to hear. Well, let's get to your last pillar before I, I want to kind of take a big picture look with you, and that's mental health. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's something where, especially during lockdowns happening around the world, you can imagine how the mental health question becomes, you know, looms larger for an organization like UNICEF that's concerned with children. Uh, what, by what angle are you taking on this issue? What do you want people to know about your focus on mental health today? So Raj, uh, when we were growing up, we didn't talk much about mental health. In fact, you were afraid to because if you said anything, your family would 
not want to be with you. And you certainly couldn't tell your boss because they might not keep you at work. So it's different now. Young people talk about it. They want to talk about it. We have to make it okay to talk about mental health. So we, as their elders, their parents, their teachers, um, their friends, we have to be willing to talk about mental health with them. Right now during COVID-19, we've seen a big rise in the demand and it's partially because uh, they're at home and at home is not necessarily a peaceful place. If someone has lost a job in your home, there's a lot of stress and often it's taken out on a spouse or the children. So there's emotional stress, there's physical violence, there's sexual violence, and it's at home. And there's nowhere for a child to go. You mentioned earlier, Raj, that often school is a place of safety where you can go talk to your friends or you can um, talk to a teacher about something that's happening at home. But homes are not, they are not violence free. So there's the home situation during COVID. There's no school, no teacher that you can report to or get protection from. And then online, the number of predators online has really increased. Uh, so more children are online. They're going to be online. It's where they are drawn to go. So we have to educate them to make sure that they know how to talk to people online, who you talk to, who you don't talk to, what you talk to them about. It's very difficult. Uh, it is a complex area for a child, but we have a responsibility as elders and as companies and as governments to try to protect children and to try to educate them about how to use um, an online world safely. So protection mental health is going to be extremely important for this generation. We think it's necessary now to save families, to keep families together but in a way that we've never seen it will affect this generation for the rest of their lives so so raj if we can we want immunization to save lives we want distance learning to save futures we want water to save communities and we want mental health to save families maybe that's a great uh, departure point to talk about kind of the big picture for a moment because all of the challenges you've just gotten into mental health as well are big thorny global challenges that it's hard to see any one government or any one set of companies or nonprofits or UN agencies solving. And you, you yourself, every time I talk with you, you're very often vocal about the need for a public private alliance and the, and the role of the private sector. You've, you've had a career in the private sector yourself as well. You know, now at 75 years of the General Assembly, you've been in this role for quite a while. How do you see kind of the future of our international system and agencies like UNICEF and where you fit in. It would be an understatement to say that there are those who don't believe in the UN. Uh, there certainly are those voices. There are those who don't believe in multilateralism, who want to take a country first kind of approach. How do you see the, the, the dynamics today from your perch? Well, we are a, um, a challenging, complex world. And we will have multilateralism, we'll have bilateralism, we'll have unilateralism, we will have every version of it. And I can tell you from this next generation coming up, they don't have um, a set point of view. There isn't one ism that they are connected to. They just want to see progress. They want to see solutions. They don't want our old thinking world. So when you then look at institutions like the United Nations, you think, all right, so how do, we, how do we make it modern? How do we make it more flexible, faster moving, more effective, and at higher scale? So one thing is what we are working on hard at the UN, which is to have every agency try to work together. It's not always easy, but we're doing it. And that's important to do as multilateral, but it's also important to do with the bilaterals. So USAID and Department of State and all of our wonderful institutions, we become stronger when we're working together because these are big problems. I don't see a world anymore that can ever go back to being just government or just uh, business or just nonprofits. We have to work together. We have different skills, different paces, different knowledge, but together 
we can be very powerful. We don't quite talk each other's language yet. I mean, we need more business people in government and we need more government people who go out into business and the NGOs we need in both areas and academia. So uh, if we can get the people to rotate and to spend time in all of these, what uh, Joe Nye sometimes calls tri-sector athletes, well, we need that in our world and that will change the nations, it will change many of our institutions and we will find better solutions together. But the world right now has to go beyond advocacy and move into solutions. I think that's our greatest strength as organizations. It's our operations on the ground. We have to deliver results for people on the ground. More than words, we need actions. I think that's a great point to end the discussion, Henrietta. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a really great theme for what we've been covering here at DevEx during the General Assembly, which is about what are some of the solutions in health? What are some of the innovations in education? What are some of the ways that the world can actually move forward? And, and as you say, it's a horrible crisis that we're in, but it also creates a moment, an opportunity perhaps. So thank you for taking some time to, to share your views with us today. And uh, congratulations on the 75 years of the General Assembly. Thank you very much, Raj. And it is a wonderful celebratory moment. So we have to think about what we've accomplished and not let any of those accomplishments go to waste. Thank you. Henry DeFore, Executive Director of UNICEF, thanks for your time.